Hello, welcome to the International Business Conversations. My name is Irina Goch, and today my guest is Professor Peter Buckley. Peter, hello, how are you? Very well, thank you. Good morning. Can you please introduce yourself? Okay, I'm Peter Buckley. I'm Professor of International Business at the University of Leeds, Professor of International Business at the University of Queensland Business School, and Visiting Professor at the Open University of Hong Kong. Um, I was President of AIB and Chair of EBA at various points, and I'm a Fellow of both of those organisations. I um, received the Jibs Platinum Award for the most papers published in the past 50 years. And also I'm a fellow of the uh, British Academy and, and was awarded the OBE in, 19, in 2012. How did your interest to the international business field emerge? Uh, right, I think from the beginning of the time that I started to do economics, was, which was at school. Economics was a, a new subject at school. And right, right from the beginning, I was interested in uh, international aspects. It, it seemed to me that the international part of trade, investment and so on was extremely interesting. I mean, why would firms want to go abroad? What were, what were the key motivations and how did that work out? And I was also interested in development. Um, I had a very early interest in development. So the two things went together. When I was making my choices for uh, economic special subjects, I chose international and development. And those are really the two, two areas of economics that I've been most interested in. Um, international economics has always led economics, many of the great innovations of e in economics have come from international economics and one of the least understood elements of uh, economics and indeed daily life is the notion of comparative advantage, which most people simply do not and never have understood that, that I can be better at everything than you are, but we could still benefit from trade between us if I choose the thing that I am most good at. And that's such a simple, but devastatingly important principle. Following from what you said, what aspects of international business do you find the mo most fascinating now? Now, I, I think the, uh, the most fascinating part of international business is, is one that, that is at, right at the forefront of research, and that is the management, organization, and orchestration of global value chains. It's become apparent for a long time that, the, that, that firms do not stand alone. No firm is an island, just as no man is an island. Uh, or woman come to that. And um, so, the orchestration of global value chains by multinational firms is, is very central to the world economy. This has been brought about, I think, by the disruption to trade and value chains of COVID and protectionism and all the other issues. And there's always a sense that you don't realize what you're missing until it's gone. And we, we missed uh, the, the frictionless trade that we've had for a while. So I think the current interest in the management, the organization of global value chains is the key to coming out of the problems that we've got, and also a really important research question. Following the orchestration of the multinational enterprise, the orchestration of the value chains, what is so special for you about multinational enterprise? There are two contradictory answers to that. The first answer is there is nothing special about the multinational enterprise. Because if you think of the theory, uh, internalization theory that Mark Kasten and I developed in 1976, it's a theory of the firm. And, um, and in that sense, a multinational firm is one that's internalized markets across international boundaries. A uninational firm is a firm that has internalized markets, but not across national boundaries. 
So the way I look at it, the way I've always looked at it, is that the uninational firm is a special case of the multinational firm, not the other way around. That's the first answer. The second answer is that I'm interested in multinationals because they are the most extreme form of the firm. If you're studying a phenomenon or an issue, one very good way of getting hold of its essence is to look at the most extreme form of that phenomenon. And the most extreme form of the firm is the multinational firm. And so uh, when we came into this subject, uh, in the 70s, multinational firms were regarded as, as evil. They were regarded as capitalistic exploiters uh, who tied up the market and so on. And our approach was to say, well, let's accept that there are monopoly elements. But the other side of the coin is the innovation that multinationals bring. And the innovation that multinationals bring is kind of the upside, whereas the monopolistic elements, which naturally go with somebody having a protected monopoly, are the downside. So in any analysis of the multinational, you have to look at the upside and the downside, at the costs and the benefits. And you also have to look at the alternative. And one of the things that the future of the multinational and all my succeeding publications since have done is take a comparative aspect. You don't ask, is a multinational a good or a bad thing? You ask, is a multinational good or better than the potential alternatives? And that is a debate that's raging at the moment in terms of um, the vaccines, okay? Do you give somebody uh, a monopoly? Do you give them a protected monopoly? Should the state be organizing this? Should private firms be organizing? What is the best way of organizing innovation? And in a sense, that is what the whole uh, of international business is about, or you can look at it in, in that way, the link between monopoly, innovation, new products, new developments, new technology, entering new markets. So international business remains incredibly relevant. I, I was doing a talk at the but really at the most pessimistic part of the current pandemic when everything was closed down. I was doing a talk in Hong Kong, for Hong Kong, for the Open University. And somebody said to me, is there any hope? You know, we're in, we're in a terrible situation here. Can you give us any hope? And I'm an eternal optimist. And I said, the, there are two things. There are two things that give us hope. One is, the ability to innovate. And the second is the ability to be flexible and to adapt to circumstances. And um, I'm quite proud of that answer because now it looks incredibly correct, but at the time people were not seeing that. And, and so the role of multinationals, I think has entered the public debate. Everybody knows at least two multinationals, Pfizer and AstraZeneca. Everybody knows the names of those firms and knows that they were the, the people who innovated and, and, and brought vaccines forward. Um, they also know there are downsides to multinationals. So, so the debate continues and, and it will do. In terms of international business students and studies, apart from those traditional subjects that international business students study and economics, what do you think are the three key subjects that international business students should learn? Um, a little while ago, my answer would have been history, sociology, and political science. However, I think the thing I would add is geography. And now, geography sounds incredibly basic, but I am constantly surprised by how little uh, information and knowledge people have on geography. Uh, I was dealing with a group of young people recently, and we were talking about cricket, and I asked them if they knew where Worcester was. None of them did. These are all English people. Now, if I ask a group of international business students, take a world map, where is Singapore, Seoul, 
and Birmingham, Alabama on that map. And I think very few people would get it right. So I think a basic knowledge of geography. Political science is the one I think that is becoming really to the fore at the moment, partly because of the obvious role of government, but also because business needs to take a very wide view of, of events at the moment. It's not just about producing goods and services. Business is having a lot of other issues laden onto it, values that perhaps it didn't have before, stakeholder movements, sustainable investment. These are all altering the landscape of business dramatically. And I think a knowledge of political science is, is really important. I am always and have been completely sold on the idea of history. You know, the world did not begin in 2010. You know, the world, we, we are the way we are because of long, long legacies. Firms are the way they are because of considerable lengths of time. I'm supervising a student uh, in, in Queensland who's working on the very long lived firms in Japan. Some of these firms are 1000 years old. There's a considerable number of firms in Japan that are 400 years old and another association for firms that are 100 years old, the relative newcomers. Now, there we are, these, these are incredibly important. And I, I did write in a recent article and nobody's picked it up, but the, the, the two most important institutions in the world economy are nation states and multinational enterprises. Both have a very long history, both are highly successful at delivering what they set out to deliver, and both have a great deal of loyalty and attachment and affinity for people. So I think we need we need the history. Um, I'm an economist, but I've always paid a lot of attention to organisation studies and sociology and so on. And I think you cannot, you know, you have to bring in lots of these other areas into international business for it to be a really meaningful and dynamic area. And they will change over time, but, but that, that's my answer for now. Going back to what you've said about the wider view, in one of your recent interviews to AIB Frontline, where you also refer to the paper with Professor Carson, you mentioned that there is a lot of boardroom view in IB, but there is not enough of the bird's eye view. Can you please elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, these are these are short terms for, for very long issues. And the boardroom view is essentially looking at the firm uh, as a self-contained strategist making decisions uh, given various constraints. The bird's eye view is trying to place the firm within a system, within a global system. And it's the global system, I think, that is the most important thing, because if we take an individual firm, we're taking a part of an integrated system. That, that firm operates within a world of nation states, of alliances, of, of currency areas, of, of, of different consumer preferences and so on. So it's very important, I think, that, that, that the, everybody uh, and their organizations who try and locate their place in the world before they try to think about, well, where do we go from here? What is our strategy? So the bird's eye view is an attempt to get an overview of the system. And I think the subject is to some extent moving in this direction. We've got the Journal of International Business Policy and the relaunch of transnational corporations from the UN, which are trying to take a more global view and trying to take a systemic view, I think, bringing in policy and so on. So I think that that is certainly one key direction in which the subject is moving. Talking about early career researchers, can you please give an advice to early career researchers, PhD students on how to how to find or create their own research path? Yeah. Well, o Oscar Wilde always is good for quotes. And Oscar Wilde said, be yourself, everybody else is taken. And I think uh, being yourself uh, and finding yourself um, is 
um, you know, is really important. What are you interested in? I mean, why, why are you doing what you're doing? You have to constantly ask yourself that question. Why, why is it, you know, what makes you get up in the morning? What makes you look at a blank piece of paper or a, a blank word document and think I've got to fill this? I've, I really have something to say. So finding that. Um, early career researchers need to read widely, not not to produce the best ever literature review, which is a very narrow way, but to find the ideas that excite them. What, I, I learned this quite early on when I was a PhD student. My PhD was on foreign direct investment in the, in the Irish Republic. And if it wasn't about foreign direct investment or Ireland, I, I wasn't interested. And my supervisor said to me, look, you've got to have, you know, you can't, You've got to look at other things. And I have always read, read widely and, and, and um, you know, I read a lot of history and, and I'm, I'm really interested in that subject. But I, I, I'm excited, you know, I, I'm still as interested and excited about what multinationals are doing and the way it's going in the world economy what, from when I started. And I think you have to find that niche and I think there's a sense in which is the, the, you know, you, you have to experiment, but you have to experiment with a view to ending up with something that says, this is Peter Buckley. You know, this is, you know, if people, I think if people see my name, they know the kind of stuff that I do, right? I, 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 and, and I think that's the goal, for, that should be the goal for a lot of, younger researchers that the, the name is not just a name oh yes that's the Jones that does the work on textile multinationals or that's the Jones that does the work on Ugandan development or whatever it is um, and, and so do do what you're interested in find a niche experiment don't be too narrow but try to find uh, an area that you get satisfaction from and that you, you, you're happy to be identified with. It's not an easy job. It, it's not an easy job. And it is emphatically not about looking at what the past three issues of Jib said and following that trend. It is not about that. Look at the past three issues. Look at what people are doing. But don't say, me too. Say, I've got to think about you know, issues that perhaps weren't covered here or issues that have been tangentially covered or goodness me, things that these people have actually got wrong. I mean, that, that's where we, Mark and I started. We just were not satisfied with the current range of thinking and people should look at it like that. It's, you know, all knowledge is provisional. It's not written in stone. I think this is a great answer and really inspiring, something that every early career researcher should hear. How do you write a textbook? With difficulty. Um, I have, uh, you know, the, the, the textbook that I've written uh, with, with colleagues on, on international business is conservatively the fourth attempt that I've had. I mean, people who approach me to write textbooks right from the early 80s. Originally, I said no, because I was concentrating on other things. But it, it, it is extremely hard. And, and I think the trick and, uh, and the only reason that I have written a textbook is that it allowed me and all, all my colleagues to, to further a particular uh, research approach, research agenda, set of research concepts around the global factory. Without that, that core set of concepts, it would have been, frankly, just another textbook. But because it's written the way it is, because it's got a definite purpose, uh, it became much easier to do. Um, to write a textbook where you think, oh, goodness me, I've got to write a chapter on finance now. I'll go away and look up finance. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to say, how does finance fit into my overall conception? So it was really writing the textbook really was about what, what are we trying to achieve here? 
And what we're trying to achieve here is a theoretically based text that is genuinely global, because one of the other things about the textbook is that it is much less Western, and I dare I say American driven than the others. We try and get examples, not just from the obvious America, China, so on, but from smaller economies, from, you know, from Indonesia, from, from, from Vietnam, from, from Myanmar, uh, uh, you know, to try and get a genuine global coverage. It is a tough job. I would not recommend it. It took me uh, a long time to find the answer to how you write a textbook. What do you think about the place of qualitative research in international business, given that many three or four star journals slightly favor quantitative papers? Um, I, I don't start from there. I think where you should start from is what is the problem? I mean, one of the things that, 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 that I kind of find, I hate to say a little irritating, is when people start by saying, I am a qualitative researcher or I am a quantitative researcher. No, you're a researcher and you're looking at a problem and you have decided that the best way of dealing with this problem is either quantitative or qualitative or a mix of the both. I've done both, as you know, and I think that's where the answer's coming, where the question's coming from. And I think there is a sense in which it is more difficult to get a qualitative piece published. And that's because amassing private, uh, amassing you know, original primary data is very difficult. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about how this should be done. They, the, the techniques and issues are developing enormously. When I look back to some of the first qualitative pieces that I wrote, they wouldn't, you know, time has moved on. It's actually be true in the quantitative too. And you have to keep up with the techniques and it is tough. And maybe there is some prejudice against it. But again, if qualitative research is the way to answer the particular problematic that you've set yourself, then go for it and do the best job you can and, and be on top of the most recent techniques uh, and, and try and do the best job you can. Uh, um, yeah. I think it, um, it goes back to the point that you said being yourself when you create your own path and thinking about how you do the best, your work the best way something like that yeah but but again don't box yourself in mm. i mean don't don't uh, any qualitative researcher in my view should know that the alternative may be quantitative techniques which they should have uh, available and an, and a quantitative researcher should also have qualitative approaches available um and uh, mixed methods are obviously the, the flavor of uh, of the month at the moment. Uh, but I think it, it's incumbent on researchers not to, you know, in the old days we used to say half technique will travel. You know, any technique, you know, if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's wrong. You've got to have a hammer and a spanner and a wrench and, a, and all the rest of it. You've got to have a toolkit available. And that investment's very important and it's best done early. What is the question you were always wanted to be asked, but never were asked? Well, I, I, think, I think questions like this, questions in interviews like this, even when they're very imaginative, are all about me. Um, and they're all about why did you do this? What do you think? So, and really, it sometimes ignores the the context. And the context is I've got massive numbers of co-authors who help enormously. I've got a family and and friends and supporters and and support staff and so on who've helped enormously. So I, I think the, the, the question should be what uh, the question I should be asked is what kind of context uh, is important for research? And the answer is, you know, a very supportive context and people who are who are who are like minded and so on. And you also I think one of the things that's, that, that people don't ask is about cooperative, the cooperative side of things. It's extremely important 
in our field and in I guess in, all, in any field of scientific endeavor to have good collaborators, good colleagues and, and, and friends who you work with over a repeat. You don't have to agree with them all the time. I mean, Mark and I argue fiercely. I mean, we had an argument a few years ago where people left the room because we were arguing so strongly and they, they were a bit taken aback by this. I can remember somebody actually leaving the room when we started arguing. So you don't have to agree, but you do have to work together, decide what the interesting issues are and so on. I mean, the whole, the future of the multinational enterprise came about because we were arguing about the different approaches to the multinational enterprise. And that book is the result of disagreements and arguments. And also who you learn from. This is another a point I made earlier. I go to history seminars when I can. I go to lots of different, I've been known to even go to literary seminars, you know, because you learn so much. It's amazing what you learn from fields that you didn't feel to be important. The other thing is, you know, this idea of the, the, the senior scholar and the junior scholar, I was asked recently at, a, um, at, an, at an accreditation board, the, guy, uh, the person who was asking the questions said, you know, how, how, you know, what are the difficulties of bringing on younger scholars? Well, yes, there are difficulties, but I said, that's the wrong way to look at it. Younger scholars, you know, invigorate, you know, people who are, who, who are established. You know, it's a two-way thing. We, we teach them experience. They, they teach us excitement, new techniques, and so on. So, you, you know, you don't, you do, it's amazing what you can learn if you keep your eyes and ears open. And if you're open to, to new things, I mean, um, you know, there's lots of techniques and ideas and things that come from subjects that, perhaps we're not entirely always open to thinking about. So, uh, yeah. Following from that, uh, I wanted to ask this question a bit later, but I think it's, it's a good time to ask it now. Have your international business knowledge change your view about something that is not directly related to international business? That's such a good question. Uh, yes. Um, I think, I think, International business knowledge. I thought about this. I think it's a super question. I think the international business knowledge is unbelievably valuable. I mean, I, I, when, I, when I saw this question, I was actually watching a film. And I thought, you know, the way I look at this film, I'm interpreting a different culture, America in the 30s, as it happened. I'm interpreting this culture in international business fashion. I'm looking at the different culture. I'm looking at the interaction. Um, I, I saw a film, I, I won't mention it because it, it got a lot of critical hammering. I, I saw a film recently, which was, it could not have happened. And the reason it could not have happened is nobody in it had any economic activity, right? There was no imports and exports from the particular community that was being looked at. They had no visible means of raising money. Now you think, wait a minute, you're looking at a film here, you know, you're enjoying yourself. You're supposed to be, but you, you ask these questions and, you know, how do people interact with a lot of, you know, I've been a member of a film club for quite a lot of my time and, and looking at films, you know, looking, you look at a film like Seven Samurai, and then it was reinterpreted as a magnificent seven. Both of them wonderful, wonderful films. Look at the cultural differences between those two films, which are about the same thing. You know, another, another Japanese film, Rashomon, where you've got different points of view on the same event. Fantastic. That's an international business learning thing. You know, if you show, I, I, I know a group of people. Uh, uh, in one of my old universities who showed the start of the Magnificent Seven as a recruitment exercise. This is, this is a recruitment exercise. Watch it and think of it as a recruitment exercise. Watch Rashomon and think about different points of view. Watch Seven Samurai and, 
the Magnificent Seven as different cultural interpretations of the same event. How can we not, how can we not be energized by international business? It absolutely beats me how people say, I can't find anything interesting in this. I mean, come on. What do you think is happening with globalization at the moment? Globalization, as always, is, is contested, it's fragmented, it's going forward in some directions, it's going backwards in other directions. And that, that's what we should expect. I mean, this is where the, 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 the multinational enterprise has proved itself since you know, the, 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 the East India Company. Uh, as being an incredibly flexible institution. It's faced, it's, uh, you know, if you're running a multinational now, you're faced with, and I've talked to people who are doing this, they're faced with restructuring their value chains, they're faced with people working in unfamiliar ways from home, they're f facing markets being closed to them by protectionism and so on, they're facing new innovations coming down the line, they're facing new demands from the workforce, from stakeholders and so on. So, but this is why managing a multinational is so exciting and frankly lucrative because you have to deal with these issues. And the flexibility, you know, the two, my two key mantras for this are flexibility and innovation. And if you have flexibility and innovation as an institution, as well as by the way, as an individual, we've all had to be flexible in it. we've all had to innovate we could not have envisaged doing this two or three years ago maybe the technology was there but would we have done it no uh so you know these are the challenges this is what makes it exciting it's not going to be a static situation the key to international business is its dynamism right as I speak, exchange rates will have changed, wage rates will have changed. There may have been climatic events during this uh, conversation. There may have been a massive political change in an important economy. Multinational managers have to deal with that on an ongoing daily basis. You do not set up a multinational and say, right, that's it. That's it. Problem solved. Let's, let's all uh, have a nice time. You have to every day innovate. And you know, some of our other institutions, and let me put universities right at the head of that, should learn from that. Sadly, they don't. What are the areas of international business that will be redefined by COVID-19? What do you think? Well, I think the whole the whole nature of international business is, is in some ways challenged i think that you know you could pick a number one obvious one is that is global value chains how they're organized how they're reconstituted whether there's some reshoring regionalization is a thing i've written about with covid other area is so that's the kind of flexibility part the innovation part is the whole notion of patents, how you reward people for innovation. Should you reward people for innovation? Should these things be patented and so on? What is the role of the state? Um, the, the, the state has actually uh, you know, expanded. Uh, will, it, will it shrink? In what areas will it go back to where it was before? In what areas will it continue? What about public-private partnerships? Massive, massive changes. What is the most rewarding thing in your work? I, 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 I think you would have to use the word creativity. I mean, what I most like, what I most enjoy is new ideas and application of ideas to new things. Uh, the bits that I don't like kind of filling in the references at the end. And uh, I have never, ever subcontracted research to anybody. If my name's on it, it's me. So I'm to blame. Uh, I don't have, a, I've never had a research assistant or anybody who I've subcontracted research to. 
And the reason is you really, you know, there's a phrase in science, in, in biology, it's an awful phrase, but it's handle your own rat. In other words, if you're doing experiments on a rat, you, you do it. You, know, you don't get somebody else to do it. So, um, and that, that, that has disadvantages because the, the, the approach becomes a kind of craft approach rather than a kind of machine approach. Uh, but, but, but I would say there are many occasions when I kind of come to a blank sheet of paper or a new Word document and I think, wow, this is great. I'm going to rock, you know, this, I'm going to say something new. I'm going to, I'm going to really try and, and uh, make sense of this problem or I'm going to really try and apply new knowledge or I'm going to really try and think of something new. Now, this may be an utter illusion. I mean, all this may have been done before, but but that's that's really what what I enjoy. It's the creativity, and also sometimes intellectual battles, intellectual arguments. I mean, I, sometimes you know, if you if you submit a paper and you get an R and R, your first thought is, oh God, you know, what a dreadful thing. But then when you think, well, the, you know, if if you've got a really good referee who's engaged with what you're trying to say who's putting a different point of view or suggesting you miss something or heaven help us that you're actually wrong you have to think you have to work that out and you know throwing your teddy out of the pram or saying I don't I'm not engaging with this that that's not the way to do it you really need to debate with people and in a debate you will make mistakes you know you say things that later you think, why on earth did I say that? What, how could I have justified that? So it's constantly going over your ideas and constantly testing them against other people. And of course, you should test them against the best other people. You know, there's no point going ahead and, and, and absolutely hammering some poor doctoral student who, who's frightened of you. That's not what it's about. What it's about is genuinely engaging with people who equally have strong views. And, and you know, I, th I think um, we're, we've had a reasonable tradition of that, but I am slightly worried about current intellectual trends which suggest that you cannot argue with somebody. I've had one or two um, R and R's have said, well, you know, this is a bit strong, or you can't really say that, or don't you want to refer back to what Blog said in 2019, you know, or something like that. I, I think we have to be reasonably robust, and 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 goodness knows, I mean, I've had a few people who've had a go at me and and my work, and uh, had real arguments with them, but not. You haven't got to let it be personal if it's about the ideas. That's the important thing. Question that I now traditionally ask all my guests. Word of advice for IB students. Uh, keep an open mind. Um, I met a I met a, an MBA student who, who was a student a long time ago, and I foolishly asked him the question, what did you learn from my course? Uh, that's foolish because he could have turned around and said absolutely nothing. But what he said was, you taught me how to think laterally. This was a senior manager in a big company. You taught me how to think laterally. And I think that's the that's a really important issue for international business, that it's always rigorously, it should be, rigorously comparative look at the word even the title international means at least two nations so you've got two things to compare right british investment in japan you can compare britain and japan how do it should we invest there should we not license there or export there comparative again and there are lots and lots of these areas where rigorous comparative work is important so um i think Keep your keep your mind, you know, don't 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 dismiss things that do not seem to be immediately relevant. And, and if if people have a definite view on something, why? 
why are people so misguided about so much? And there's often a reason why they're misguided from my, from our point, from the, the individual's point of view. You've got to look at it. You might end up thinking, actually, they're not misguided. They're actually right. So you really have to, you really have to go in with an open mind, rigorously evaluate things. But again, coming back to one of my earlier answers, be yourself, right? You know, everybody else is taken. Mark Casson's taken. You know, you can't be Mark Casson, but you can be you, and you can be a very good version of you. But the other thing is, you've got to work at this. It's not easy. You know, it's all right for me to come on and say, take a blank piece of paper. I do know what that means. It means hard work. It means that you read all the literature, you've got it at your fingertips before you start. You don't have to go off and think, goodness me, what, what's the most recent kids thing? Because you're, it, you're on top of it and then you can do something creative. You know, there's, there's also this thing about disruption and, and, you know, changing the rules of the game. Rubbish. You have to know the rules of the game before you can alter them, right? You have to understand the rules of the game. You can't just bring a bulldozer in because the answer will be, you didn't understand the rules, you know, football, you can't pick up the ball and run with it. That's not an innovation. That is not within the rules. But a new tactical formation, there we go. That's something interesting. That that may well help. So knowing, knowing this is where students being and younger staff being told to know the literature, this is what it's about. If you know where the research frontier is, you've got a chance of going beyond it. If you don't know where the research frontier is, you're going to be wallowing around in stuff that people have done years ago. And somebody will point out, wait a minute, Adam Smith said that in 1776. You know, you missed that. So you've got to really, got to know where the research frontier is. And that is hard work. And creativity is hard work. It's not about the light bulb going on. It's about really working at things arguing things through, talking things through, checking things out. It's tough. It's tough. But it's exciting and it's fun and, and, and that's what it's all about. I agree. Thank you so much, Peter, for your time. Um, thank you again. Thank you for... Thank you. Enjoyed it very much. Thanks a lot. Excellent answers. And I also enjoyed the interview. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye, take care.